instructions for an artwork. Layers closing in so close they blur. Depiction of a haunting, how to show what is not there. Memories collide with visions of the future. It's a feeling that trails blue, unravels green, and mixing them makes a sound like humming. Gray skies veil over the void of the universe. These strokes are a beckoning hand. These splatters wail like a banshee who signals Kanaloa to claim us all for his realm. Or is it just the echo of the alala between the footfalls of rats and the sputters of tired diesel engines? I recently came across this poem. It was a stream of consciousness free write that had been stuffed inside a notebook. Preparing for this show, I came across the poem again and was amazed at how these words written at the beginning of my journey had unknowingly described what I would create at the end of it. And yet, the idea of non-linear cycling, of memory blending into the future, and the internal landscape spilling out into external geographies makes the vision and the reality of this poem a perfect embodiment of the complex themes at play in my paintings. It is a deeply personal, inward space where I hold the abstract, emotional core that drives my art practice. It is also this personal space that connects me to the globally shared experience of loss, ecological trauma, and the disconnect that the age of the Anthropocene yields. This body of work, entitled Atlas of the Disappearing, uses abstraction to fuse together the internal emotional landscape and the external physical world to address disappearance, extinction, and the climate crisis. Rather than documentation or navigation guidance, this atlas expresses the complex experience of nature as we know it in the present, the overlaid arrangements that comprise its landscapes. And as it transforms, disappears, to hold the fragments of these landscapes as collective memory. The idea of loss and disappearance as it relates to the natural world and the climate crisis is a paradox. Even as science proves that the ecological threat is both intimate and universal, that very threat essentially becomes abstract. Reflective of the existential circumstance of this paradox, all of the paintings in this body of work are large, abstract diptychs. The layering of materials, overlays of varying opacity, and embedded topographies portray the concept of landscape as both the historical and the psychological embodiment of anthropogenic damage. With both physical and conceptual overlays, my paintings take on the shape of the landscape, blurring depictions of life forms with geographies like mountain ranges, ocean horizons, fog banks, or skylines. Improvisational techniques of pouring, dripping, and large broad gestures of intuitive movement are allusions to enduring landscapes generating something akin to lyricisms or emotions. At the same time, more controlled and intentional techniques such as collage, drawing, and scrawled verbal expression layer an intentional consciousness into the unconscious marks, evoking the tension of the duality of the internal versus the external the observations of the outside from within itself. I use both lyricism and abstraction to conjure the inverted and diametric pain of only realizing the vast importance of something, in this case life on earth as we know it, the moment it vanishes. The parallel abstract paintings, Shadow Time and Epoquitude, explore the understanding that habitable land is shrinking, compressing biodiversity, moving towards a near-future wasteland variegated with toxic plumes of industrial waste and impending torrents of extreme weather. The horizon is haunted with the mists of ghost species. Songbirds and bats spiral down from unlivable altitudes. Seals and fish become an underwater cumulus of natural and synthetic deritus. The tension of the duality of motion, submergence and unearthing, disorients the space within the paintings and alludes to an expanding world beyond the constraints of the canvas. 
The scale of these two paintings is meant to swallow the viewer when standing close. Together they are 14 feet wide by 10 feet tall. Standing farther back, the viewer can see the entire span of the paintings at once, where they meld into a whole, a world that seems to be simultaneously collapsing in on itself and forcibly pushing itself apart. Deep in the distance, the wavering impressions of urban ruins or tattered mountains carve themselves into the shadows. This earthly nature is something we, as humans, are still supremely vulnerable to, while also holding the capacity to change it so dramatically as to render it unrecognizable, effectively destroying it. This duplicitous sensation, joy and abandon of the experience of wilderness, mixed with the horrific knowledge of its disappearance and demise, is what inspires both the titles and the diptych presentation of these two paintings. Shadow Time describes the sense of living in two or more timescales simultaneously, or the acute consciousness of the possibility that the near future will be drastically different than the present. The material fragments in my painting conjure the inward and outward movement of Shadow Time, a continuously moving dialogue, a dynamic equilibrium. Epoquitude gives a name to the understanding that though humanity might destroy itself, the earth will survive. In fact, it has survived epochs before us, and there will be countless that succeed us. The feeling of insignificance is a comfort somehow, an awareness that we are part of an earth organism made up of a myriad of life forms. Likewise, these paintings are one large object that is made up of tiny moments, brush strokes, small dabs of paint, torn pieces of paper, and scrawled words. Entangled and ensnared are non-identical mirror images that reference and evoke marine life caught in abandoned industrial fishing nets. Commonly known as ghost nets, these lethal plastic byproducts of the fishing industry ride on ocean currents like insatiable mythological demons. Their very nature is designed to snare and capture. Cast off by their ships to roam water's depths, they continue snuffing out any life form that has the misfortune of crossing paths with these monstrosities. In these two paintings, the bodily presence of the forms emerging from the amorphous liquid surroundings is meant to be unsettling and engrossing. The portrait orientation underscores the implication of personhood presented by both canvases. Placed side by side, the curvature of the brush strokes and the washes creates the illusion that the paintings are turning to face each other. Delicate, multicolored lines flare out from the physical formations. At first glance, they appear organized like spider webs, but on closer examination, they seem to animate and tangle themselves in greedy chaos around the central form. The lines which intentionally sit on the surface of the paintings are in opposition to the forms. The tension between the drawn line and the painted form is meant to be uncomfortable, a boundary that keeps the viewer from sinking into the washes of color, holding them to the surface and demanding to be seen. However, an act of subterfuge is also taking place. The luminous, cascading blues of ensnared and the swirling crimson of entangled lure the viewer in. Much like the vivid hues of ocean water are adulterated by the Protean inundation of toxic plastic, deeper submergence in these paintings reveals sinister scribbled entanglements and chaotic anxieties. In Entangled and Ensnared, the viewer becomes both the trapped creature and the entrapping net. As part of my research on landscapes transformed by the climate crisis, I visited Big Sur, California in 2019, where I explored the eroding coastal regions and the inland forests still smoldering from devastating wildfires. Renowned for its wild shorelines and primordial giant trees, the region is threatened by the climate crisis on multiple fronts. Meanwhile, the maritime fog that is essential to the coastal forests withstanding months of drought is disappearing as global warming conditions affect oceanic and atmospheric phenomena. These fogs are also crucial for the mitigation of wildfires, which are rapidly increasing in quantity and severity. With this knowledge of the precarious California coastal ecosystems, I returned to my studio and the painting entitled From Above, From Within, 
drench the fires that chase us began to take shape. Initially, the two panels were painted with intense greens, translucent blues, and charcoal blacks in response to the cathedral-like redwood forests of Big Sur, where the massive charred trunks contrast against the vivid greens of persistent foliage. However, as the painting sat in my studio over the span of 17 months, they slowly transformed. As I worked into the paintings, the charred black engulfed the greens and blues, and a vibrant synthetic red appeared. At a later stage, the red swept like fire across both canvases, followed almost immediately by an ominous anthraquinon blue. Finally, after months of transformation, the white cloud emerged on the canvas, conjuring the duality of destruction and creation, the enveloping plumes of smoke that expand across the wildfire's landscape, and the life-giving summer fogs that are essential to those ancient forests. From above, from within, drench the fires that chase us is as much a subject of its process as it is a symbolic depiction of the subject through its process. In this way, the two paintings embody the layered histories of threatened and transforming landscapes. As a body of work, Atlas of the Disappearing attempts to embrace nature on its own terms, to reveal new understandings of what comprises landscape and to counteract a future of selective amnesia where the disconnect between ourselves as nature and nature as other expands into chasm. I make art because we must remember, we must pay attention, we must mourn, and we must move forward. So